today. And we'd actually talk about having Sue talk first for a few minutes because she's going to talk a little bit about just like, I think the idea about setting up your edible garden and, you know, why you would do it and certain ways to do it. And, and then I might talk to you a little bit about just like what to do in the garden in September in the fall since that's relevant right now, sort of what you can still do and what to think about going into the winter. And then hopefully we'll just spend most of the time answering whatever questions people have because that will probably be the most productive use of our time. So Sue and I. Thank you. Um, yeah, I just wanted to take a moment. Let me get away. This microphone is better if I'm away, right? <laughs> there. Okay. Is it me? Yeah, it's a little sensitive. Just be real still with the microphone. Okay. I'm Italian and I move my hands a lot, so. <laughs> And so what that means is really creating space. You can't just kind of throw something in and hope that that's a good place to grow it. You really need to define the space, um, you know, finding sunny spots, ways to get water to it, how to harvest, all of those things. I'm a big fan of container garden edibles. Um, you can't always find the space, so maybe it's right by the back door and it's a lush, overfulling tomato up the center in a cage and, and you know, creeping thyme com coming over the side, basil tucked around the edges. All of those things, because abundance happens when you have the space to do it instead of it being so incidental. And so, um, you know, as we kind of get some time to talk, if you have questions about building raised beds or anything like that, I'd love to share some more about that. I'm going to let Colin kind of do a little bit of brief. And I do have a handout to you, a little more inspiration for you on creating some edible spaces in your garden. So, you know, kind of think of some questions. Okay, um, so I will talk uh, relatively briefly about you know what is happening in the garden right now, and you know what maybe you could be going out there and doing, depending on if you have a garden set up or you're just about to set up a garden. Um, one of the key things, you know, if you don't have a garden set up or you're thinking about expanding, is that the fall and winter is actually at a great time to put in a garden. Um, waiting until the spring when things are actually starting to grow is obviously it just creates a generally stressful event if you decide, I'm going to build a garden because I want to plant tomatoes this weekend. Um, and a lot of times that ends up, you know, creating a situation where maybe the garden isn't built as well as it should be or that you're just getting things in later than you want. So actually, if you know you're going to be expanding your garden or building a new garden, starting to do that now is actually a great, great idea. We're very fortunate here, as you probably know, that the ground pretty much never freezes. So it's actually possible to be working outside in your yard throughout the entire winter. And we, at Saddle Urban Farm, we build gardens for a living, and we're installing new vegetable gardens through December and January, February, and it's very rare that we ever actually have to stop sort of doing garden building structure. Um, so if you have a garden that's already set up, Chances are many of your crops right now are being harvested. Um, lots of things are finishing up and need to come out of the garden. Um, and that you know, creates an opportunity to plant things for the fall. Um, one of the things that I think is complicated for people a lot of times is that many of the things that people will call a fall crop is actually something that gets planted in the late summer. Um, so certain things you may be thinking about, oh, I'm going to go right now in September cabbage um, and some of those crops are actually best planted earlier and even as early as the end of July or early August for them to actually size up and be ready to harvest by the fall or the early winter. Um, so it's not really a great time of year to go out and plant cabbage seeds in the ground. Um, whole weather is going to come on too quickly that the plant actually won't be able to size up before that happens and it'll probably either sit there very small and then set up flowers next spring or may even die in a hard frost. Um, so the goal with those crops is actually get them to grow to cold size before we get into frost weather and then they can usually survive through the winter and you can harvest them either in the late winter or in the early spring. Um, similarly, carrots is something people do as a fall crop but we usually stop seeing carrots by the end of August so that they can also size up. And the great thing about doing carrots in the fall is that you can leave them and sort of store them in the garden through most of the winter, uh, sort of an outdoor refrigerator for some of these crops. Um, but instead of telling you what you can't do right now, um, I guess I should focus on, you know, those are things to think about for next year and sort of, I guess the general idea is there's always something you can do. 
you know, during the season, but you can't do everything you want right now. Um, we are still planting salad greens. So salad greens are very fast growing crops. Um, the most winter hardy crop that people like to grow is typically spinach. So right now is a good time to be seeding spinach. If you could get transplants here or something like that, that would also be an effective thing to do. So if there are salad green starts back there, uh, spinach would be something that would be great to plant right now. And spinach is a phenomenal overwintering crop because if you do get it in early enough and it becomes established before really cold weather sets in, um, it'll be full size and you can actually go out and harvest it. And even though growth is very slow for the winter, uh, a very healthy spinach plant you could harvest about once a month throughout the winter. So you get four or five harvests on it before the spring comes around and you want to pull the crop out and replace it. Um, so it's probably one of the most productive and typically healthy crops to grow over winter. In addition to that, um, you know, you can still do cilantro, which is, you know, a really fast growing herb. Um, and it's actually kind of nice to grow cilantro in the fall because it will germinate when the weather's like this, but it's actually, once it's established, it's really cold tolerant as well. Last year we had cilantro live throughout the entire winter and take light frost. Um, in a really cold winter, you might end up losing it, but uh, seeding it right now, you know, spending 20 cents worth of seed is definitely worth the chance that you might have cilantro thick all winter. And cilantro especially, which is very notorious for bolting throughout much of the season, it bolts very quickly, that process it goes a lot slower during the winter. Um, in addition to that, mustard greens. Um, if mustard greens is something you already like or you think you could learn to like, that is one of my favorite things to plant in the fall garden. Uh, they're very tasty, they're very spicy, and they're very cold hardy and they grow really well throughout the winter. So mizuna is a really easy to grow crop, probably the easiest crop possible to grow in our climate almost any time of year, and that includes throughout the entire winter. There's also lots of mustard mixes and other type of, you know, strange mustard um, plants out there that you can put in your garden they would live throughout the winter. Um, in addition to that, coming up, and this doesn't happen quite yet, but it's garlic planting season in the fall, and we usually plant garlic at the very end of October or even sort of like the very beginning of November. The idea is you want to get garlic in after the weather's cold enough that it won't sprout right away. If you plant your garlic now, um, it would probably sprout and you have a, a little grain shoot that was a few inches tall and that's a lot more likely to be damaged over winter with cold weather um, than if the sort of the little garlic cloves just in the ground and waiting to come up in the spring. And it's important to grow garlic or plant garlic in the fall because it needs to get exposed to that cold weather in order to perform well the next year. So people sometimes will plant garlic in the spring, um, which can work, but typically it will not turn into a big bulb, or if it does, it's very small, or it may just sort of send up a shoot and you don't really get any bulbing out of it, which is great if you want to grow green garlic, which is something that people do, but if you want to get a big head, you want to have it out so that it sits in the garden all winter. Um, and that sort of triggers a mechanism inside the plant that tells it to sort of start dividing and form, you know, from one clove into an entire fall. So, you know, starting around mid or late October, start thinking about putting your garlic in the garden. Um, and, you know, I guess in general, the garden is going to be mostly empty by probably the end of October because most of your summer crops and spring crops will be finished and almost all that space will probably be empty. Maybe you'll have a few patches of greens, or maybe you'll choose not to grow anything through the winter because um, you don't feel like it, or you'll be out of town. And so the fall is a really, really great time to add amendments to your soil. And um, the first thing to think about is the pH of your soil. Every year here in Seattle, your soil is probably becoming slightly more acidic. Um, all the rain that we get through the year is, has a slightly acidic pH, and so over time, garden soil is always just becoming a little more and more acidic. Um, and vegetable crops like slightly acidic soil. Typically, they want a soil between 6.9 and 6.3 or something, um, you know, which is on the pH scale, which goes from 0 to 14, and so 7 is neutral. And if anybody remembers this from sort of high school chemistry class. Um, but it's really easy to get a pH kit or a pH meter and uh, just stick it in the soil and see what your pH is. If your pH drops below the, the ideal range for vegetables, like below 6.3, um, it prevents the plants from uptaking nutrients from your soil. So even if you go out there and you're adding tons of organic fertilizers and things to your soil, 
if the soil is extremely acidic, they might not be able to absorb that, which means they won't grow very well. So we typically recommend you know, checking your pH in the fall, and chances are you're gonna add lime to your soil either every winter or every other winter. As a default, we usually tell people if you're not gonna check the pH, um, just plan to add lime to your garden soil every other winter. And it's nice to add it in the winter because it takes a few months for that lime to sort of be incorporated into the soil and actually change the pH. If you forget to add it in the fall, it'd be better to add it in the spring than to wait a whole other year because sort of like the sooner you get it done, the better, but it takes a few months to take action, which is why right now is like the perfect time to do it. Um, you know, in addition to that, it's a really good time just to add other amendments to your soil, compost in particular. We recommend adding compost to the garden every season, and fall is a great time to do it because you can just sort of add it to the garden after you clear it out as a, like a top dressing, um, which covers up the garden, makes it look nicer, and that also allows the compost to sort of continue breaking down for the winter, and the nutrients in it will sort of slowly reach into your garden soil and be more available for the plants next spring. Um, I would recommend against plant adding any other sort of organic fertilizers to the soil at this time because most of those will completely break down and wash out of the soil by the time the spring comes around, so it would kind of be a waste of resources. Um, but definitely adding lime, which increases the alkalinity of your soil, and adding compost in the fall are really great ideas. Did you have a question? So yeah, the question is, is it a good idea to put straw on top of your garden beds? Um, and I think, well, the answer is yes and no. Um, in my opinion, straw in our climate can create problems because it, it actually acts as like the ideal slug habitat. So slugs really like to go into that sort of like moist, but like sort of like big organic pile or something. Um, so what I've seen is that when people do top dress their beds with Straw that when they pull it off in the spring, they sort of created a place for slugs to hang out all winter right on top of their garden beds. Um, and that's kind of frustrating because I, virtually anywhere else in the country um, where they do have slug problems, if I don't think as bad as we do, it's a really great because it slowly breaks down and adds tons of nutrients to your soil, prevents weeds from coming up, um, and it's overall like a really great mulch. But we pretty much choose not to use it essentially just because of the slug issue that we see. Um, but if you do have a really, really weedy area, um, sheet mulching over the winter can really help. So if you want to lay down something like a newspaper or cardboard underneath the compost, um, it helps to sort of like block out the light to all those weeds. Um, and the compost might not be completely decomposed by next year, which means you might have to take it out um, while you're working your soil, but it would probably help keep things down. Um, yes? Um, maybe this is one that both of you can address. I, I think you're doing um, some raised bed veggies in certain places. And, and I know that you know about containers. I'm just growing now uh, for the first time in the great big horse troughs. And um, when I bought the horse troughs, the guys brought them and filled them about two thirds with uh, a, a topsoil mix. And it wouldn't have been my first choice, but it was done and I had to live with it. So I've been amending with the soil building compost, but it still didn't, it wasn't good this year. Um, so any ideas that you can help me with for those big, large sized containers and fixing that soil so I can grow more? Well, I can, yeah, I can take it on. I, um, I, I didn't yes, probably have like a three-way go in the I bottom. Guess, uh, yeah. Did everybody hear the question she was asking about really amending? You have a great Voice. Everybody probably heard but amending that soil. And that, to me, um, when you have two different kind of soil layers, you really do. You have that healthy one that you keep yeah. amending, and then exactly, you're, you're like the rock layer is just the other side of the mountain. And so, if there's a way you can really stir that up, is that enough? I, I think it is because one thing you're doing is adding in that organic amendment. That's your best tool because it's working and changing the soil structure and giving a lot more back to the soil. But that three-way usually just kind of depletes really fast and there's probably a lot of sand in there from the three-way. And so that'll help with drainage, but you know, hopefully you took care, you, I know you put holes in the bottom of that thing. 
so that it drains well. But really, to me, it's just really stirring it up and making sure you're adding that amendment to really start to recreate. Because it doesn't have the luxury to pull from nature because it's always in the container. So you have to you know, add that stuff. And in those large containers, am I still adding things like alfalfa meal or kelp meal? Or, I mean, in a confined space like that, I might use to it for, for that large size. Yeah. Um, I actually think adding fertilizers is twice as important in a container than it is in an in-ground garden. But I mean, and, I've um, seen, you know, for, for that, for that, like, horse crop size, it right. was like alfalfa meal or cow meal, or that was the most efficient? Um, yeah, I mean, everybody has different opinions about exactly which fertilizers they like to use best and they think work best. Um, we usually use sort of a, a blend of things, like, a, like an all-purpose fertilizer, um, you know, that has kelp meal and blood meal and bone meal um, and stuff like that in it, and we'll add that to that to the the beds every single season. Are you doing um, that in winter? No, I usually that like spring would be a really good time to add those. Um, a lot of that stuff will break down for over the course of winter, and it'll just sort of end up running out of the out of the bed. Um, but you want to do it in the spring before planting, and then if you're growing in it throughout the summer and you're growing things like tomatoes with really long season crops, you're probably going to want to fertilize those again, um, maybe once or twice. And what I actually find is really effective in a container system is adding liquid fertilizers as well. So there's really good liquid organic fertilizers, and you can add those every couple weeks. Um, the watering cycle usually in a, in a container is you're watering more often. Um, because the soil dries out more quickly, and so you're watering fertilizers out of it. And so they're actually just washing through the soil and out the bottom more quickly, so you actually end up wanting to add them on a lot more regular basis, like more than you initially think. That makes sense. Yeah, did you have a question? Um, yeah, so the question is, what is uh, my opinion on manure? And, uh, <laughs> I mean, I think manure is fantastic. Uh, and I think that that is like a type of like manure, like composted manure is a really great amendment to add to the garden. What I prefer to do, or I think would be ideal, is sort of every time you add compost, add a different type of compost. So, you know, if one year you just add something from yard waste, because um, that's what you have, or the next year you add chicken manure, or the next year you add steer manure, you know, and the next year you add horse manure, you add mushroom compost, and you add worm casting. And you're, the idea is you're just like building as complex of a nutrient sort of base as you can. Um, so, you know, at certain types of manure, um, the only like potential complication is if you're adding tons and tons of like, composted chicken manure or something that has lots of potassium in it. Uh, so if you're adding the same nutrients over and over and over again, and potassium is a really particular one, it's really easy to build up high potassium levels. Um, and potassium is a super essential plant nutrient but it's also easy to overdo it, and once it hits above a certain range, it becomes kind of toxic to the plants. Actually, it affects like their ability to grow. So you don't necessarily want to just go add a foot of chicken manure every year to your garden and assume it's going to be good. Um, and the best thing to do, honestly, um, if you get deep into this, you really like doing it, is to take a soil sample like every year, and then you know, like you actually have some sort of information to base your fertilization practices off of. Um, and doing a soil sample is really easy. You can mail it in. It's really expensive. You can get it done for 10 or $15. And then you just get this thing, like an a readout of what your pH is, all your nutrient levels, um, and actually recommendations of how to fertilize it going forward if you want to grow vegetables. Um, and any, any like professional grower, like farmer or something, maybe take soil samples at least every year, if not a couple times a year, because it's just a lot more information. You're not just sort of you know, in the dark about what you're adding to your soil. Yeah, yes. chickens around or some way of creating your own um, amendments is amazing, you know, and so if you have the luxury of having chickens or your own compost pile, like that, taking stuff from your yard and actually being able to put it back in the garden is the ideal scenario, you know, and, and certainly for a lot of people that works and for some people they don't have the space or the ability to do that, but 
I, I love, I have chickens as well. Yeah. These are newer, yes? Yeah. Oh, no. Yeah. 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 So the question was, how deep would you want a raised bed to be if you were working on top of something like really heavy clay? Um, and for, in my opinion, 18 inches is like an ideal depth. Um, you can build taller than that. You can build two or three feet, and it would always be better. But the comparison, in my experience, between a six-inch tall raised bed that doesn't really have anything under it, or a 12-inch tall or an 18-inch tall, is there actually a really big jump in health and productivity once you get to that 18 inches of soil depth. Um, we do have gardens, a lot of gardens actually, that are built on hard surfaces that only have 12-inch deep beds because that was all that was practical, and they do well. And they do, I mean, so that would be totally fine if volume of soil and like cost of raised bed material was an issue. I think you could have a really productive garden with 12 inches, but if I was doing it, my recommendation would be to just go ahead and put it up to 18 inches if you can, and it makes a really big difference. And um, the type of soil you put in there is obviously hugely important. And one actual blend that's available locally that we use a lot is, is the Cedar Grove. They actually have their, that's something called vegetable garden mix. Um, and it's basically like a three-way soil that has compost and sand and topsoil. Um, and it, has proven very well, like very adaptable for a raised bed where it has a good structure so water can move through it, um, but it also provides a lot of nutrients and, and seems to work really well. well I was just looking um, also at the, some of the products they have here. The Cedar Grove actually is, is one wonderful because you can get it in bulk. So if you're building some beds, you need some substance, you can get it in a load. But if you're you know, just working at amending or wanting to add more, uh, Garden and Bloom is a really great product. Their soil building compost, I use it a lot. And I bring in truckloads of manure. I have chickens, and they say real quick on uh, the chicken thing that I do, because uh, you know, I could, I'm not a, a, a farmer, <laughs> but I'm a city girl farmer, and I have some chickens. And um, with their manures, uh, we add, um, it's either straw or it's the cedar chips that I keep in their poop to keep the coop nice and dry and clean and bug free, especially the cedar, that mixes with the, with the uh, chicken poop. And uh, so I set that aside and then that's ready really quickly within a season because that hot manure is starting to break down and, and it creates a nice fluffy top dressing that I side dress all my raspberries. It's real lazy, you know, and literally they do get all my weeds as well. The girls get those the weeds. I mean, if you start reading studies about if, if all our bees disappeared, kind of a thing, we would have zero food, and people don't even make that connection that we would have no food because we would have no fruiting, we'd have all of those things would happen. So pollinators are vital, and part of pollination in a garden, especially a city garden, um, or even in container gardens, is, is bringing attraction in. And attraction isn't always like that cute red flower that the hummingbird goes to. Attraction is flowers that bring in pollinators and give them a place to live and, and hatch and do all of those things as well. So it's really important. To me, it's the balance of the garden. It, and especially if you bring in um, some of the fruiting edibles um, for the berries, things like that, anything with, that attracts because it's a heavy fruiter will also attract heavy pollination. And so having all of that in, I, I love blueberry hedges. I mean, they just really bring in magic. They bring in the birth in the later season. When do you start? When you start blueberries? I, I love planting in the fall, especially shrubs. And that's, you can consider that a small shrub. Uh, fall planting right now, snag some blueberries, get a hedge in, because 
Uh, in the fall, what's going to happen is, uh, I mean, now it's have bare rooted in the spring, March, you know, early, you know. But right now, if you could get some blueberries, and I know they have them because I saw them here, um, and get in a hedge, what you're doing is you're relying on the natural rainfall that is coming. You know, it's going to be here. And so you're not out the end of the hose trying to keep that plant happy all the time. It's going into dormancy, and then you get the springtime. You don't have to wait for that plant to get through the transplant. It's already ready, and it's already starting to bloom and get its root for the season. So you kick in a good season. Sunlight in general for Um, hi, there's cranberry, and 
these are the vaccinians, really wonderful wine. And the thing I love about these is, is not only this abundance of color and fruit, the birds go crazy for it, but also a nice fall color. So that becomes more ornamental, but you can make a nice sour jelly with this and all kinds of things. So I have a list. So when we're done addressing any other, Production gardens, 
and it's a program we're hoping to keep expanding. Um, the way that it works, or it can work, is that we'll go and maybe on the rooftop that's available, set up a garden, you know, a thousand square feet or two thousand square feet, and then we come back and we sort of just manage it throughout the season, trying to get produce to come off the roof all through the year. And the, you know, the kitchen staff they dictate what gets grown in the garden. They say we want to try these varieties, you know, these unique things or these crops that we use all the time. And and our job is to go up there and just try to make that garden produce as much of that food as possible. And it's really fun because you know, in Seattle with our mild climate, you know, if you build a garden and you give it winter protection, you can grow food all year round. So uh, there's a lot that can be done here. Yeah, and so I do have a website. I have cars that I guess you know just put over here. If anybody wants to check out our projects or email us or see what we're up to ongoing, uh, that'd be great. Yeah.